Hello, my name is Neil Heck, and this is my presentation called Isolation. As many of you know, in March, cities around the world and most countries, as well as in America, decided to go on a lockdown. And now what a lockdown was for a lot of people just meant stay in your home for a period of time. In reality, what it should have been is stay in your home, don't leave unless it's absolutely necessary, like groceries, food, medication, doctor's appointments, things of that nature. At this time in March and during the majority of the fall and summer, COVID-19 was getting attention around the world and starting to just kind of explode. And to most people, um, it hindered on their day-to-day -day activities and isolation really was new to everybody around the world. And so what I'm going to do is dive a little bit into that. And then I will go into a questionnaire that I saw, which then prompted me to make my own questionnaire and get about 12 people and send them this questionnaire. And then I analyze the results and kind of see where we can go, grow and learn from this. So once lockdown started, I realized that I was alone. I lived alone and I knew that I was going to have to isolate myself. And I actually personally did not leave my apartment for an entire month. Um, I kind of figured that something like this was going to happen. So what I decided to do is store a bunch of food, get everything that I needed, and I stayed in. A couple things that I didn't realize when that was happening was how it would affect my mental health my physical health, and my car's health. I didn't start my car, so over a month went by, I went down to try to start my car, and it didn't start. But the longer you're isolated without people, what are the effects? And that's really what I wanted to learn, since it affected me, and I figured there was other people in the world that had to be like me, maybe students, parents, whoever it may be. With that being said, Things like cabin fever, isolation, being alone were all thrown into the mix. And I didn't quite understand what they meant. I didn't think I was going to develop cabin fever. I didn't think that that was kind of a real thing. I thought my mental health was strong enough to get through three weeks, a month, maybe even two months of not really having that human interaction. But since those terms are being thrown around, let's actually describe it. When I was researching cabin fever, Really, when you kind of look at it, it just seems like it would be annoying. Just you're annoyed. You know, you have irritability. You're restless. And you're confined to a space when you get cabin fever. Hence the term cabin. Because when you think of a cabin, a cabin's in the woods and there's no one there. So let's move on to describing maybe a little bit more about what those actions are, what you can do. So, being alone, being isolated, maybe having cabin fever. I did some research and found out that essentially a lot of people who are alone all the time or are isolated, they have dark feelings, bad feelings, and they start to develop other mental disorders that a lot of people throw around very loosely, you know, like I'm depressed or I just have a lot of anxiety. Well, of course, things like that can be amplified, not just the fact that now that you're alone, but you're alone during a pandemic, and there are people all over the world dying from a disease that is very easy to, or a virus that is very easy to catch. You're filled with a bunch of information. You don't know if things are true. And all of a sudden, you're put into isolation by yourself. Not to state or overstate, but... When I looked up a lot of research on this, I found out that this is very common when these things happen. There's a lot of suicidal thoughts. There's a lot of insomnia. There's a lot of depression. And it weighs heavily on your mind to think like that all the time. So the solution is keeping yourself distracted or occupied. How do we get there? And that's one thing I wanted to have people take away from this at the end is I don't just provide the facts what people are feeling, there's also some solution towards the end. And we'll look into that in a minute. 
So if all of that can happen when we're not having human interaction, does that mean that we truly need human interaction? And another thing is, how do you or anybody describe what interaction really is? And that's another thing that I think needs to be discussed, discussed more and more about this. But do we need it? Everything that I've read states that essentially the answer is yes. How much depends on the person. But we need it. We're social creatures. We need interaction with other people, whether it's just talking, seeing them, going to the grocery store, bumping into them on the street, whatever it is, talking to them on the phone. We need that. And that actually helps our mental state. It helps us not experience cases of cabin fever. It helps us with not having all those negative thoughts and negative ideas. But going further than that, what is interaction? Does it have to happen in person? Currently, right now, and a lot of people during lockdown, or if you were quarantined because you tested positive for COVID, you can't have that interaction. We all have been watching the news and hearing stories of loved ones are dying alone. And that's the saddest part about a lot of this is a lot of the people that are dying from COVID are dying alone. And there's no interaction that they can have with anybody because the risk is that person could catch it and potentially die as well. So it sounds like we do need interaction. Maybe we just need to start defining what that interaction is going to be for everybody as well as for yourself. And that's how you can help prevent some of these things. But now let's go into a questionnaire where we can learn a little bit more about the stresses that this lockdown and things like that impose on people. So what I wanted to do was find a study about lockdowns, isolation, and how it affected people. What I was originally planning to do was looking at the past pandemic in the 1900s, but then I stumbled across a study that was done in India with students who were going to become nurses, doctors in the medical field who were being affected, isolated, and locked down during COVID-19. And the questionnaire had about 20 questions. Most were about mental health and studying. And as you can see there, most of them, um, it's split almost down the middle pretty closely between men and women. And the age groups are younger uh, around 22, 23, and most of them were single, which did help because when I did my study, it was almost split down the middle, seven men, five women, and most of them were single, some were married. So in their questionnaire, I loved a lot of the questions that they posed. Um, these aren't all the questions, but I did take some of these questions and put it into my own because I felt that they were exactly the same type of questions that I was trying to get. Have you felt depressed during this quarantine? Have you felt hopeless, exhausted, or emotionally unresponsive during this quarantine? Have you had thoughts about being infected? Have you had a sense of being emotionally detached from friends, family, et cetera? Do you invest a lot of time on watching things, reading things about COVID-19 related information? I thought all of those were very important questions. The only issue that I had with the study is the strongly agree, neutral, strongly disagree. I felt like it would have been better if it was more of a yes or no, and that's kind of the route that I took, just because I didn't want people thinking too hard upon it. You know, depression, like I stated before, is such a hard word. But it's very simple if it's just a yes or a no. Have you felt depressed? Sure. Maybe. Once. And there you go. So that's what some of the questions that I took from this. So, now it's on to my own questionnaire. I took some of the questions from the previous. And then upon further reflection, I added my own questions as well. I had 12 people ranging from 28 to 71, five women, seven men. And one thing that I do have to state is everybody was an American. They live in America. 
it's not the same uh, maybe demographics. It's, it's not the same uh, culture that the other study did, but that other study provided a lot of background and idea of kind of how to run this. Another thing I wanted is I wanted it to feel lighter and easy. Yes, some of the questions might be challenging. Um, I did have one question about finances in there, but I didn't want it to be too overbearing. I wanted it to be anonymous so that way nobody felt that I was judging them or could judge them. Another thing, I, I, I because America was, and currently right now even, we're such in a, in a tumultuous state, I didn't want to ask questions about politics. I didn't want to ask questions about math. Didn't want to ask questions about facts or, 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 you know, is this right or is that right or money or, you know, getting those checks. Maybe the finance, yes, but, but I didn't want dividing questions because what I wanted to focus more on was the human interaction and where can we go from here, which is why I wanted people who lived either A, lived alone or B, lived with only one other person. So that way, they weren't surrounded by a lot of people with a lot of interaction. So here are my pretty much yes-no questions. Um, I did throw maybe in there um, just to see and kind of give somebody a, a way out. Um, but these are the, the majority. These are all my yes-no questions. Um, I felt like they were pretty pretty much yes-no, and. I also took some of these from the other ones, but some I made up myself. Um, you know, did you go into lockdown? Uh, did you spend most of your lockdown alone? Do you feel the need for human contact or interaction? Um, have you felt depressed during the quarantine is one that I took from the other one. The frequent thoughts about being infected I took from that other study. And these are just the ones that are yes, no, maybe was in there. Um, most people never selected maybe anyway. Open-ended question. So I didn't just want it to be yes or no. I wanted it to be open-ended a little bit. I also wanted to get more of an interaction, get people thinking, and try to see if there was something I could help other people with. And so some of these I chose were, was there a hobby, DIY project, or something that you did on your own? What was your biggest distraction or crutch? So that way I could try to see if I could help other people out next time, or if there is another quarantine, or if there is another issue. Um, I also wanted to know, did you speak to your friends and family before COVID? If you did, how many times a week did you do it? Then, during COVID, did that change? Maybe you had more free time. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't want to talk to certain family members. Maybe you did. And then another thing was about human interaction. How long did it take you to feel comfortable to meet with your friends again? Speaking to friends and family. At the beginning of this, I personally spoke with my dad almost every day, spoke with most of my friends a lot, did not speak to my mom a lot. During quarantine, I spoke to my mom every single day. There might have been one or two days where we didn't, and if we didn't speak on the phone, we texted. But I wanted to know what other people had went through. So I posed the question, how often do you speak to your friends and family before COVID? And I got an answer that I thought was very typical. You know, most people are going to say two to three times a week, five to six times a week, basically once a week. That's what I figured. Then, how often do you speak to your friends and family during COVID? And what I saw was that it grew. More people spoke to them once a day. The majority of people continued to stay the same. But it does look like there was a little bit more interaction with friends and family during COVID. Now, it's not drastic, but I think that if I had a larger pool, it might have shown a bigger significance. But it does prove just one thing, is that we are all just one phone call away. So 
go ahead and make that call. So now that everybody is at home, now that people are working from home, now that people are going to school from home, but also that's where you spend your leisure time is at home a lot of times as well. Now that's being mixed. So I wanted to ask a couple questions just to see if things had changed because people have been moving home and working from home. So I asked a question like, did you notice that your work performance may have taken a hit? They were split on it. Some people said yes. Some people said no. What about thoughts about being infected? I thought this was going to be a lot higher. I know I certainly have had that feeling. Most people said no. It was actually eight to four. Eight people said no. I never really had that worry. Financial stress. This is the one that I thought that the majority of people would say yes, and I'm going to chalk that one maybe to a yes. So eight to four in yes, which I thought was very reasonable, seeing how some people might have lost their jobs or, you know, you don't know where your job is going to go. You don't know what's going to happen. Mind and body. I think that a lot of us have been feeling anxious, sad, depressed, scared, alone, worried, a lot. From the results that I found was we're spending a lot more time focusing on this issue of COVID-19. We are feeling more anxious or having trouble sleeping. We do feel isolated and cut off. And we do feel the need for that human contact interaction. All of these four questions at the bottom state that we need to have these meetings with our friends and family. And then the worrisome part is, what do you do when you are going to go meet them? How are you going to handle that situation? But again, I didn't. I can't focus on that. It's a very open-ended, you know, are you going to wear a mask? Are you going to be outside? Is there going to be, you know, all these things. So what I wanted to ask is, how long did it make you to feel, make you feel comfortable to meet with your friends? How long did that take? And what I found out is the majority of people aren't comfortable more than a month or five months. It's taken a very long time for a lot of people to be comfortable with having that interaction, which isn't surprising, seeing how everybody else also agreed that they need it, but they're scared, or they're reading a lot of information that's maybe affecting the way everybody deals with it. So it's very interesting to see that while a lot of people want that interaction, crave that interaction, maybe need it, are feeling isolated, are scared to then go out and go meet with their friends and family because they're not comfortable to do so. When I set out to first start this project, I didn't think I was going to be doing a questionnaire. And when I did that, I thought, well, that's great. Do a questionnaire, ask people a bunch of questions. It'll be negative. But then I, I decided to put in some questions about, well, how'd you guys get through this time? What did you guys do? What hobbies? What distractions? What new things? What things changed? Before it, a lot of people blatantly stated in the question, you know, what's something you miss? The majority of it is going out with friends, going to the gym, going to a movie, going out to eat, hanging out with friends, going to a bar, things like that. Well, yeah, that's interaction. But now that you can't do that, what'd you learn from it? So what I learned is a lot more people are working out at home. They got more time. They're not traveling. There's a lot of hours in the day. Talking to friends and family. Video games. Streaming services. Everybody knows everybody who has Netflix. Or if you don't, then you're on somebody else's account and you're not paying for it. What about around the house? Some people took up baking. Some people painted their house. Somebody built a computer. A lot of people put reading, which I found was very interesting because I love to read. And I think that it's very neat to see that reading is kind of coming back. Some practices are not the best, but yet they still were a crutch for a lot of people during this time. 
social media obsession. A lot of people put that they're on TikTok, and downloaded Snapchat, doing different things. But again, there's a social aspect to that. There's a little bit of interaction in there. A lot of people put alcohol. A lot of people put food. We still needed those crutches to get us through the day. And that's why I put them under not the best practices, but hey, as long as you're safe and it's getting you through a little bit of tough time, that's what it's there for. So as I stated before, I started this just trying to figure out, do we need interaction? And what I'm starting to realize is we might have to define what we think interaction is. Because in today's day and age, we have technology. We have Zoom. We have the internet. We have Wi-Fi. We have texting. We have Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. I can go on and on. We have all these things where we still are able to interact with people. So is it human-to-human contact? Is it face-to-face? Is it a Zoom meeting? Does a five-minute phone call get you through the day? What is that? And I think that's something going forward when people look at this as opposed to previous pandemics or other different lockdown situations is, were you actually still able to talk with a person? Because I think that changes what the outcome is going to be. Another thing to take away from this is I didn't just want to present everybody has problems, we have these issues, everybody's agreeing that they're scared or isolated or whatever. At the end, I put that hobbies and distractions because I wanted people to see there are other ways to get through it, as well as people are doing the same thing that you're doing to encourage them. There are solutions. Go read. Build a computer. Maybe drink a little bit of alcohol, not too much. Maybe talk to your friends and family more. I, there's there's tons of different things that you can realize that now you're not alone. You're not obsessing over something that you can't control. Another thing to take away from this is that I probably needed a bigger audience. I don't think that I got enough diversity as well as 12 people just doesn't seem like enough. It got me the results that I wasn't expecting. I thought more people were going to be afraid about being uh infected. I thought more people wanted to, you know, talk to their family members more. I thought people were going to be a lot more worried about financial stress and things like that. So those are my preconditioned things coming into here, but I did not want that to affect what happened here. So I was surprised about my results, but I think that's a good thing. I think that if you come into any of this, thinking that you know what isolation is or you know how it's going to affect you or you know that everybody's scared or not everybody is going to be comfortable with meeting everybody. That's just not the case. One thing is keep an open mind. Listen. And talk to people. Whether it's on the phone, whether it's on the Zoom call, whether it's through a text message Reach out because other people are going to be reaching out as well. And I think that'll get all of us through this as well as I think we're going to become closer than ever because of this. Because we're all realizing human interaction is something we actually need. Thank you.